At the recent uh, workshop held by the Toronto Psychoanalytic Society on my recent book, Psychoanalytic Thinking, uh, most of the participants, senior colleagues at uh, the TPS, seem to support and uh, find value in my distinction between superego and conscience, and my call to reverse Freud's 1923 decision uh, to fold conscience and ego ideal into superego, uh, supporting my position that they ought to be separated out, um, and that we should be operating with a five structure model of the mind, id, ego, superego, ego ideal, and conscience, such that we can study not only the conflicts within each of the five, but also the conflicts among them. Uh, when you eliminate overlaps, there are 15 conflicts, and we haven't studied uh, more than about half of them. Uh, so this argument about reviving the idea of a separate conscience capable of conflicting with the superego, as well as with the id and the ego. Um, this seems to make sense to people, um, but what um, does not seem to make sense to them is my support for Freud's own view uh, that the superego needs to be, quotes, demolished. Um, that's his term. Uh, he was joined in that by Shandor Ferenczi, who said there is no uh, complete analytic cure that does not achieve the complete elimination of the superego. And Franz Alexander uh, also agreed with this position because he viewed the superego as an outmoded, useless, archaic, maladapted structure that had outlived its usefulness and that maturation required its elimination. So this language of demolition and elimination um, uh, seems to be unacceptable uh, or disturbing uh, to many colleagues uh, who prefer to continue uh, to follow James Strachey as the field in general turned away from Freud, Ferenczi, and Alexander and instead embraced James Strachey <clears throat> who argued that um, the superego cannot be eliminated or demolished um, but only modified uh, or modulated, <clears throat> moderated. Um, so that was Strachey's uh, position in his classic uh, paper um, uh, on the therapeutic action of psychoanalysis. Um, the patient comes in with a severe superego. He agrees with Freud that the sadistic severe superego is a at the core of psychopathology. The patient projects this critical superego onto the analyst only to perceive that the analyst does not react in a sadistic, harsh, and judgmental way. And in this way, the superego comes to be moderated, modulated. Um, so from Strachey's point of view, the most that can be accomplished is such modulation. In the background, of course, um, is Strachey's idea that, you know, you can't uh, do without the superego altogether because Freud had identified conscience with superego. So demolishing the superego would mean uh, demolishing the conscience. Freud, of course, uh, hoped that the conscience function could be transferred to the rational ego. And uh, I've argued in several places that this is impossible, 
um, because as David Hume pointed out in the 18th century, you cannot deduce an ought from an is that um, the ego, uh, together with rationality and science, uh, is descriptive. It cannot be prescriptive. It can tell you how to build a bridge, but it can't tell you whether you ought to build a bridge. Uh, value judgments have to come from some other source other than reason or science. And since the ego is the seat of reason and reality testing in the personality, uh, the ego is unable to serve as a source of values, as a conscience. So I've argued that conscience has to come from somewhere else. And I, of course, argue that it comes from our primate inheritance. Uh, it comes from our innate need for attachment, our, our tendency to form attachments. Uh, it comes from our need for a good object, our need to find a good loving object, and our need to give back love for love that we receive. That is, it comes from our identification with the nurturer. In any case, um, the majority of the field opted for Strachey against Freud, Alexander, and Ferenczi, and this language of demolition or elimination of the superego was replaced with the goal of superego modification, uh, which has the ring of a very more uh, realistic, um, a more practical, a more reasonable, uh, in other words, a more liberal aim. The language of elimination, demolition, well, that's a revolutionary language. That's not the language of piecemeal social reform. It's not a moderate language. It's a radical language, uh, a revolutionary language. And uh, I continue to defend Freud uh, in this particular radical moment of his thinking. I mean, overall, he was anything but a, a radical, although many people seek to make him out as one. Uh, yeah, he uh, gave some support to free clinics. Uh, yes, he saw uh, economic and social injustice and uh, fundamentally a welfare state kind of thinker. He was a supporter. Uh, some people try to represent him as a, a, a social democrat, as a socialist, which he clearly was not. Much of his thinking is uh, extremely conservative, even reactionary. Uh, his work on groups, describing them as mobs, reflects bourgeois hostility to, towards the workers. He often described the proletariat as lazy and oversexed. Um, he was a bourgeois thinker. Uh, he had uh, a bourgeois suspicion of radical democracy. Uh, uh, so at best, a kind of welfare state liberal with um, real reactionary leanings um, in civilization and its <clears throat> discontents. Um, <clears throat> he really is a supporter of authority. He's uh, a supporter of the superego and he has this contradictory view of the superego in his clinical work. He sees that the sadistic superego is at the core of psychopathology and over time he describes it in more and more severe terms. And yet in civilization and its discontents, suddenly it's a good cop necessary to preserve civilization from a descent into, into barbarism. Um, but in this one area, in his clinical insight, that the goal of psychoanalysis is the elimination, the demolition of the superego, here Freud is being radical, and I join him in his radicalism. 
the superego is a dictator and when you are opposing a dictator piecemeal social reform won't cut it in the face of a dictator what is needed is revolt and revolution sometimes assassination Dietrich Bonhoeffer joined the plot to assassinate Adolf Hitler mad dogs need to be put down and the superego I submit is a mad dog after all the superego is at the root of suicide I mean it's a it's a force a destructive and aggressive force inside oneself that sometimes drives one to kill oneself that is an enemy and an enemy like that needs to be put down so all of this liberal practical sounding talk about modification and modulation that's all very well but the problem is that dictators aren't interested in modification and modulation so a much more aggressive resistance to the superego is necessary and that's why I support Freud's terminology demolition now practically speaking could it ever be possible to entirely eliminate or demolish the superego probably not I'll make that concession um, I don't think anyone can be so well analyzed that uh, the hostile superego is entirely eliminated from time to time there will be regressions uh, a person will regress um, certainly from a Kleinian point of view uh, mental life is an ongoing oscillation between the two positions the more mature depressive or reparative position on the one hand and the paranoid schizoid position on the other um, from my point of view the hostile superego is a feature of the paranoid schizoid position it reflects its splitting uh, and its aggressive destructiveness and uh, so we oscillate between D and PS and when we oscillate back when we regress back into PS we are regressing into an area where the hostile superego is at work again so uh, so I can see that complete elimination of the superego is not possible um, because regression cannot always be prevented progress in analysis means moving to a, a space where such regressions are minimal where they are rare and where where when they happen they are very brief because one uh, has acquired the capacity to dig oneself out of the regression and that capacity to dig out of the regression is precisely the capacity to demolish the superego yet again so no permanent demolition um, from time to time the superego will emerge out of its crypt and uh, try to do all of its damage yet again but progress in analysis means learning how to more quickly and effectively put it down again so I'm not giving up the radical language of demolishing eliminating killing the superego I'm simply acknowledging that this murderous task uh, is one that is never entirely finished because the superego is never entirely finished off and we need to remain on guard now of course this is entirely in keeping with democratic theory democratic theory sees the tendency towards tyranny as intrinsic 
In democratic theory, we must always remain on guard against the rise of tyranny, the regression into tyranny. This is the rise of the tyrannical superego. We must be on guard and we must be prepared to demolish it. Yet again, and of course, every time we demolish it, it generally gets that much easier uh, to demolish it in future. Now, of course, this is an aggressive task. This is using aggression against the superego instead of allowing the superego to usurp our aggression and turn it against ourselves. Superego is driven by id aggression turned on the self. What I'm saying is that we need to use our id aggression to demolish the superego rather than giving it over to the superego to demolish us. Okay. Now, another line of argument against uh, this goal of demolition of the superego is the, uh, is the argument that the superego for Freud is a two-tier phenomenon. At the core, it is id aggression turned away from others back against ourselves. That's the core. But once that's in place, the second layer of the superego is internalization of the cultural values and the social norms and values uh, via the parents' superego. Okay, so there's this internalized socio-cultural uh, layer. Uh, it's like the rule book. Um, surely the critics say we can't do without this. In order to function socially, we have to know the rules. Uh, we have to know what people expect of us. And therefore, we could not ever entirely eliminate the superego. I reject this argument on the basis that we have an ego. And the ego is perfectly capable of knowing the rules. The rational ego is perfectly capable of knowing what society expects of us. And it is perfectly capable of deciding whether to either comply with those expectations or rebel against them. We don't need a superego to know the rules. The ego is perfectly capable of knowing. So I think that this is a, um, an invalid argument for uh, resisting the idea of superego demolition. Finally, uh, I want to turn to uh, speculating about the underlying motivation of those who are made uncomfortable by this language, this radical language of demolition and elimination. Um, of course, this is an ad hominem speculation. It doesn't invalidate their argument. It merely uh, tries to speculate about the motivation underlying their, their feeling of a need to resist demolition and elimination. And of course, I think that motive is precisely their fear and awe of the superego, God, the Father, which means that on some level they are still little children uh, trembling with fear and awe of the powerful Father, God, uh, and I think they, on some level, hear a voice saying, how dare you presume to demolish your father? How dare you presume to eliminate your father? All of which means that on some level they are still children and they have not overcome their fear of the uh, exalted father god superego. Uh, which means on some level there is a failure to grow up here. Um, and of course, 
it is the same uh, fear that I think underlies uh, those critics who defend Freud's version of the Oedipal resolution as against Hans Lowald's and Eli Sagan's and mine. I mean, for Freud, the Oedipal resolution is basically knuckling under to the father and giving up the mother, giving up the incest wish, and giving up the hostile competitiveness with the father. To me, this is, this is a neurotic failure to resolve the Oedipus complex. This is a kind of self-castration. Um, the, the healthy resolution is the symbolic or sublimated killing of the father and the symbolic or sublimated sexual possession of the mother. Now I'm underlying the words symbolic and sublimated. Um, but on some level, however symbolic, however sublimated, the act of growing up is on a primary process level understood as a killing act. Uh, I recall when I completed my PhD degree, my father and mother took me uh, up to the top of the CN Tower, which was new then, and it has a revolving restaurant, and, and over dinner, as the lights came on over the city, my father presented me with a, a card in which he'd written a long inscription conveying his pride and love for me. Uh, and they gave me a wonderful present. And all the while, I'm sitting there feeling that I had just planted a dagger between his shoulder blades. Because up until then, he he had been the only Dr. Carbath. And, and now, I'm Dr. Carbath. And, and I'm feeling like I just bumped him off the log. Bumped him off. Um, now, of course, this is all neurotic. Uh, thankfully, it didn't prevent me from getting my PhD. Um, that was irrational fantasy. But my act of growing up involved me having to f summon the courage to commit what I felt was a killing. Now, of course, it was not a killing, but it felt like one. And growing up and becoming uh, a successful uh, person invariably does feel like a kind of killing and one must find the courage to do it in this symbolic way. Uh, but I think this language, uh, just like the language of demolition and elimination of the superego, makes people very nervous because um, because, like Freud himself, um, a part of them remains intimidated, intimidated, and compliant, and therefore they long to be moderates. But you can't be moderate in the face of dictators, especially dictators that are out to kill you, like the superego very often is. Okay.